Thank you, band. That was wonderful. So the topic is meditation is the gateway, the gateway to accessing the flow of divine energy. And why do we want to do that? Well, it makes a difference in the world. When you are expressing who you really are, you are changing the world. So that's our motivation. That's why we want to access that divine flow. In Genesis 1, we're told that we are created in the image and likeness of God. Now, 99.5% of the people who've ever read that said, well, it must be that God has a body just like ours. Well, I want to disabuse you of that notion because indeed divinity is itself consciousness, infinite, intelligent consciousness. And that's a, that's a, a very different concept than some guy with a long beard up in the sky judging everybody. Because we know from thousands of years of mystics and saints conversations, they have tapped into the reality of what's going on. And they have told us that that's not the way God operates or is. So, we are all one. We've heard that a number of times. Jesus, when he was wandering the earth as a rabbi, said that on a number of occasions. I and the Father are one, and you and I are one, and we are all one. He said that in the Course in Miracles. And John fourteen twenty, we are all one. And what does one mean? Well, one is we are created just the, in the image and likeness of the creator, and that is consciousness itself. So in order to talk about this concept of accessing the divine flow, I thought I would review a little bit about what I had to say last month in terms of science and consciousness. Science, particularly physics, has been at the forefront of changing the way we think about the way the world works. First, there was Einstein's relativity theory, and then came along quantum mechanics. And the two really kind of collided a little bit. The mathematics didn't match up very well. So the latest development in the world of astrophysics and cosmology is string theory. And in string theory, it's posited that there are these probably seven different realms of unlimited non-local energy vibrates at a very high rate, so high that we can't even measure it. We can't register it on even the most sensitive our, of our instruments. So how do we know that this is anything real? How do we know that? Well, it's mathematically proven that the, that is the way, and trust me, I do not understand the mathematics. Engineering and I came to a parting of the ways over calculus, for crying out loud, let alone um, higher mathematics. But that's what we're told, that mathematically, string theory is what rules the universe. And in string theory, there is this energetic, and it's two-dimensional, two-dimensional, not three-dimensional. And it's like a hologram. This two-dimensional energy field 
is where the instructions to create the three-dimensional universe exist. The three-dimensional universe probably began with the Big Bang, but it may have come earlier. And this three-dimensional universe arose with perfect, perfect design parameters. The, the, the possibility that this happened randomly is just astronomically. It's, it's, it, it just boggles the mind at how impossible it would be for this to have randomly occurred. So this universe exists and we want to understand our position in this universe. And this energy field is non-local and non-local is a, a fancy term for time and distance don't matter. They don't exist because in a, in a non-local field of energy there, it extends forever beyond the edge of the universe. Again, it's very difficult to wrap your hands around this concept, but it's important because we want to be grounded in an understanding of what's going on in the world. So our physical body is a three-dimensional projection of our own energy body, which is a two-dimensional non-local energy field. And that energy field is really a hologram. And how do we know that this is true? How does that make any possible sense? Well, we can look first at the placebo effect. One of the great stories on the placebo effect it's a story of Mr. Wright, who was dying of lymphoma in 1956. And he had orange-sized tumors all over his neck and his groin and his stomach. And he was struggling to ha actually breathe. He was in the hospital, and, they discovered, and there was this drug trial called Krabiazin. And he became convinced that he would be saved by Krabiazin. So the doctors administered a shot of Krabiazin. And two days later, he was walking around the ward, chatting and happy as a clam. And his tumors had shrunk by 50%. And they considered, continued treating him for another 10 days and discharged him from the hospital. He went out and got back in his airplane and was flying around in his airplane after this episode with Krabiazin. But then, darn, Time Magazine sent, published an article saying that it was highly doubtful that Krabiazin was any good. And poor Mr. Wright read this article and said, uh-oh. And he, he went back and his tumor started growing again. And he wound up back in the hospital. And the doctors decided to lie to him. They decided that they would tell him this story, this fable. And they said to him, there's a new double strength, extra strength form of Krabiazin, and we'll have some tomorrow, and we'll give you an injection of it tomorrow. Guess what? They gave him the, an injection of saline solution, nothing in it, no more crabiazin, and his tumors disappeared. And they, he went back out, walking the streets, flying his airplane, and then it was published that crabiazin was totally worthless. By the way, that in the first trial, he was the only one that had got any benefit out of crabiazin. All the rest of the people in the hospital who were on that drug trial, no benefit at all. Anyway, so he learned that it was totally useless. And three days later, he died. So 
that is an example of how the deeply held beliefs control the projection of our three-dimensional body. That two-dimensional energy field that is our subtle energy field, some call it the the, the energy <laughs> that's okay <laughs> that's okay it's called some call it the astral body the subtle body the etheric body or the spirit body but that's what controls what projects into our physical realm and in 1976, there was a gastric cancer drug trial in England. It had over 400 subjects who were part and parcel of this experimental chemotherapy drug. And so all 400 people were told of the very likely side effects. And one of the side effects that was most likely was losing hair. So. The study went forward and 200 of the people got the drug and 200 people got an, uh, an infusion of saline solution. And of the people who were given the, the placebo, 30% of them lost all their hair. From what? They, they only had saline solution in their bloodstream. What did they have? They had a belief that they were gonna lose their hair and they sure hoped they were would because that would mean they got the drug and they, and they generated a hair loss directly related to what they believed. And then there's the extremely dramatic evidence of b deeply held beliefs controlling physical outpicturings in the stories of the people with multiple personality disorder. That amazing, amazing, impossible changes take place when a different personality comes into the body. One personality is left-handed, another personality is right-handed. One personality has moles all on the arm, and another personality has no moles. The moles disappear almost instantaneously. How does that happen? It happens as a result of the deeply held belief structure that is inherent in that personality that shows up. And one of the most amazing um, examples is one personality had blue eyes and the, another personality had, a, had green eyes. Just not possible to think, well, I think I'll change my, I've been brown eyes for 80 years. I think, I think I'd like to have blue eyes. No, it doesn't happen that way because this is a deeply held belief structure that's in your mind. So what we're up to and what we want to accomplish is to rewire our belief system. That's what we need to do. And, you know, by the time we're preteens, we've pretty much wired ourselves into paying a lot of attention to what goes on with our five physical senses. We don't pay any attention to what goes on at the subtle level. We're just literally talked out of it. And so by the time we're adults, we're, we're worried about this and that and the other thing that's all related to our physical structure. And what we're really needing to do is to rewire our brain. And the way to get at that is to stop paying attention 
to your five senses. And the way to get out of your sensibility, to coin a term, is to get quiet and lose track of what your five senses are saying to you. And that's why meditation is the answer, because that is a process by which you engage your mind in not paying attention to what's going on in your five senses. And there are hundreds of methods of meditation, but they all have one thing in common, and that is to quiet the mind. And when people start a meditation practice, they're very frustrated because the monkey mind shows up. And you meditate for 13 seconds and all of a sudden you're thinking about what's coming up for breakfast tomorrow or some other thing that is distracting you away from what you're after. And what, what we're really after is tuning in to the still small voice that lies within. And it's a very still voice. It's not loud and it doesn't intend to sh shout down the five senses. You have to be willing to focus your attention. Many people focus their attention on breathing and just pay attention to the breathing in and breathing out and and focusing right here between the eyebrows, um, which energizes the prefrontal cortex. And that, by definition, de-energizes the, the rest of the brain that listens up into the five senses. So that's the secret to tuning in to this flow of divine energy. It's a still small voice. It wants us to realize our God nature. We are God in manifestation and essence. And until we learn how to do that, we're paying a lot of attention to our five senses and not paying attention to who we really are. I mean, we are spirit. We are spirit having a human experience. And we have thousands of years of saints and sages telling us how to get there. If you've ever read Yogananda's book, Autobiography of a Yogi, it's, it's a perfect example of how to get there. And it's meditate, meditate, meditate. And you have to keep after it because it's just like anything else. If you sit down to play the piano, you know you start out with chopsticks, right? And pretty soon you can graduate to another level. But my history with meditation is much the same. I start one and I lose track of it and I forget what I'm doing. And I've recently resumed a meditation practice when I got through thinking about this, I've decided that that's really what I have to do. And you have to, you have to practice, practice, practice. It's not going to come in the twinkling of an eye. People who have had near-death experiences have had such a powerful experience that years and years afterwards, they can still feel the benefits of that dramatic change in consciousness. For those of us who haven't had a near-death experience, we have to work harder at it, so meditation is the way to get there. So my invitation to you is if you'd like to improve your life, improve your God consciousness to be more loving, more compassionate, 
and to be who you really are, because you're already that, you've just been talked out of being that. So the answer I suggest, if you wish to pr improve your life and your consciousness is to meditate. And so that's my opinion today. And I reserve the right to change my mind because I never know what comes down the bike in my library tomorrow. That's it. Meditate.